we thank you um, that you're here in this place this morning. And uh, we just thank you for meeting us here, Father. We just pray that as Tucker uh, brings uh, your word to us today, that you will speak through him and that you open our hearts and our minds to receive the message, Lord, that you have prepared for us. So, Father, I just pray that uh, you just bless our day here. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be back here. I think it was about a year ago that I was here uh, as well, right before my wife and I got married, uh, July 20th. Um, my wife and I were just, uh, my wife's name is Aaliyah, we were just in Sioux Falls a couple months ago visiting her parents. And as we were driving back home, I realized I had that feeling that I was forgetting something. Sure enough, I was forgetting my iPad at her parents' house, and we weren't going to be there again for probably about a month. And as I was starting to think about all the things I use my iPad for, I realized how much I take it for granted all the things that I do with my iPad, whether it be uh, email, calendar, whatever it might be. And as I was thinking about that, I was thinking of how often we tend to take for granted all the technology that we see around us. I want to list off a few here. A computer, the airplane, radio, and TV. Now, what do all four of these things have in common? Yes, all of them have made communication a lot easier. All of them have made the world much smaller uh, and it easier to interact with people all across the globe. But this is not what I'm thinking of when it comes to these inventions. You see, all four of these things, the computer, airplane, radio, and TV, were all predicted to fail by their first critics. I want to read to you a quote that I found in an article by Mary Bellis. In her article entitled, Bad Predictions, this is what Thomas Watson said in 1943. He was the chairman of IBM. He says, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. And today, there are over... Roughly, probably one to two billion, with a B, computers in the world. Uh, another, Wilbur Wright, the father of aviation, in 1901 said that man will not fly for 50 years. And two years later, in 1903, the Wright brothers made their first successful flight. Or Lee DeForest was a real pioneer in making AM radio stations possible. And he wound up in court because of this. Listen to what the district attorney said about this, this particular individual. Lee DeForest has said in many newspapers and over his signature that it would be possible to transmit the human voice across the Atlantic before many years. Now based on these absurd and deliberately misleading statements, the misguided public has been persuaded to purchase stock in his company. And it wasn't much later that we were able to successfully transmit radio waves across the Atlantic. Now, it's a bit ironic that this same man, DeForest, who really was the pioneer for radio, he said this about the TV. He said that it would be an ir a relevant, uh, wasted endeavor uh, to pursue making a TV. Now, can you imagine, imagine with me, if we didn't have any one of those inventions, the computer, how would your life be different without the computer? How would your life be different without an airplane? How would it be different? We don't use the radio much, but um, how would it be different with things that are related to the radio? How would it be different without TV? Probably be pretty different than it is now. Now, what if those people that invented those things would have listened to those first critics? What if, uh, what if, Thomas Watson of IBM uh, really didn't pursue computers because he actually believed that there would be only a market for five? Or what if the TV was really considered to be irrelevant? It would be much different today. These so-called foolish inventions turned out to be works of genius and brilliance and have impacted the globe in so many profound ways. 
It's not just these inventions, however, though, that are considered foolish because the world thinks that the Word of God and God's wisdom is foolish. The world says that God's wisdom is foolish. Worldly critics say that the Bible is irrelevant. It does not give us an accurate picture of of who God is. Well, this hostility of the world against God's wisdom and the Word of God is easy to spot most of the time. What's hard to spot, though, is where these ideas have crept into the church itself. Well, how the church has accommodated to the world. The wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world are, are diametrically opposed to one another. So what are we supposed to do as followers of Jesus in the church? What are we supposed to do when the world says that the wisdom of God, the word of God, is foolish? How are we supposed to react? Do we make the gospel more attractive? Do we accommodate so that people will believe in the gospel? What do we do? Paul addressed these very questions in the book of Corinth, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, written to the city of Corinth, which was very much like one of our cities today. You can see a picture of the city of Corinth here on the screen, which this is the sort of the main area of Corinth where daily life would have happened. Corinth's unique location was on a, an isthmus which connected the Greek mainland to the Peloponnesian Peninsula just to the south. And so trade and sea traffic came through Corinth and there was a great trade in not only uh, material things but also ideas. You would have traveling speakers, kind of like uh, motivational speakers today, who would come to the city of Corinth and teach people how they could get out of the state of poverty that some of them were in and into a state of success. If you follow my ways, you will have a successful life. And many of these people followed after these traveling teachers. The next picture you'll see here is of a temple of the god Apollo. The god Apollo was the god of oracles, health, and youth who is celebrated here at Corinth. So it gives you a little bit of a picture of this city that the Apostle Paul came into. A very much like one of our cities today. Everybody kind of chasing after what they want to try to get ahead in life. And then sometime around 50 AD, a new voice was heard in Corinth. The Apostle Paul visited Corinth and established the first church in about 50 AD, and his message was different than those other messages that were heard. His message was this, that through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, we can have the hope of eternal life. Now, crucifixion has become sort of civilized in our society today. We have crucifixion, we have cross candles, we have cross wall decorations, we wear crosses around our necks. We have virtually anything, you can put a cross on it and it becomes fashionable. But in this culture, you would not want to speak about crucifixion. Crucifixion was reserved for, for only the uh, most... Uh, hostile offenders, the, the worst criminals a crucifixion was reserved for. However, as a result of Paul's initial preaching that through the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection, some people believed. It's estimated that maybe the early church of Corinth, you can see Corinth on the left side, uh, the left side map of the map here. And you can see how it's connecting uh, those two pieces of land. The first church of Corinth probably had about 50 people in it, maybe a little bit bigger. These are the people that believed that Jesus Christ died and rose again. In this culture, however, that prized reason, knowledge, and eloquence of speech, such a message about the cross of Christ would have seemed foolish to to many people. The message of the cross seemed irrelevant and you know, what is this strange teaching? Many of them probably would have thought to themselves. And s perhaps due to outside pressures, some in the church started accommodating to the surrounding world and started softening the gospel 
and emptying it of its power. And to that, Paul has these words. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. It'll also be on the screen as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. Paul says that the word of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now I want to look at this passage in three sections. The first Section, verses 18 and 19. So look with me to those verses. The word or message of the cross is folly or foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, here in these verses, Paul does two things. First, he pits the wisdom of God against the wisdom of of the world and says these two things are diametrically opposed to one another the wisdom of god and the wisdom of the world and the second thing he does is he says there are only two categories of people in the world he says that their first category is this those who are being saved the first category of people is those who are being saved who have trusted in this gospel message to these the gospel is the very power and work of God. These are able to accept the wisdom of God. To them, it's not foolishness. The second category are those that reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. To them, the gospel is foolishness. To these people, the gospel seems contrary to all reason. It seems contrary to any plan that they think would work. To those who are perishing, the cross does not seem to measure up with the wisest in the world. God's ways, though, are so much bigger than man's ways, so much grander than we could possibly conceive of. And Paul says here that God's wisdom destroys the wisdom of the world. Now think about that for a minute. The wisdom of God which the world thinks is foolish, destroys the wisdom of the world. I've had the opportunity to go to the University of Minnesota and engage in students' uh, discussions on the street about matters of faith. And oftentimes I'll go up to them and ask them, first, I mean, do you believe in God? And then if you believe in God, what God do you believe in? And just engage them in discussion. But the moment it seems that when you bring up Jesus or the gospel, all of these defenses go up and they begin to get hostile and begin to, uh, some have, uh, I mean, some have, uh, they start to mock you for what you're saying. 
But really, we shouldn't be too surprised. Um, This only confirms what Paul says here, that to the world, the cross is foolishness. Now, for some reason, there are reasons why they have become so hostile. Maybe it's because of going through high school and college, or maybe they didn't grow up in a great home life. But for whatever reason, they're hostile towards the cross. And Paul says that to the world, the cross is foolishness. Now, secondly, look at verses 20 to 25. Paul says that God makes foolish the wisdom of the world through the foolishness of preaching Christ crucified. Paul calls out this foolishness of the world's so-called wisdom and says that God cannot be known. God cannot be known through the wisdom of the world. God cannot be known through the wisdom of the world. He says to the Jews... Jesus is a stumbling block. To the Jews, Jesus was a stumbling block. Now, why would Jesus be a stumbling block to the Jews? Well, many Jews in that day were looking for this political Messiah who is going to rescue the Jewish nation from the hand of Rome. So it was inconceivable for them to think that the Messiah could actually be uh, apparently defeated by the hands of the Romans. It was inconceivable for them to think of, to think of a Messiah like that. How could the crucifixion of our Messiah be part of God's plan? In the Greco-Roman world, the Greeks, in their culture, they prized wisdom and knowledge above everything else. Philosophy, invented by the Greeks, means love of wisdom. They prized prized wisdom above everything else in society and culture. And they thought that they were pretty good with what they knew. They thought they knew a lot about knowledge and wisdom. They thought they had the upper hand. Now, no doubt, when we think of wisdom in our culture, what do we tend to think about? We think of maybe our university professors. Maybe we think of teachers that we've had. Maybe we think of actual subjects like math or science. And in many respects, science seems to have become the god of our culture. Many believe that science can answer any question that we put to it. Our Western world is also fascinated with Eastern mysticism and New Age philosophy. You don't have to travel to India or to the East to dabble in things of Eastern mysticism. You can go right down the street and have access to such things. But all of this so-called wisdom has been made foolish by God. The wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. Our own concepts that we make up of who God is is foolishness and laughable in God's eyes. God cannot be known by our wisdom. The cross, however, is the very wisdom and power of Of God. The cross is the very wisdom and power of God. It was intricately planned by God Himself. And then, thirdly, here, we see the Corinthian experience. Look at the remaining verses here in this passage. If the Corinthians were not ready to believe Paul's words, Paul said, Take a look at yourselves. If you're not ready to accept that the wisdom of God is wiser than man's wisdom and that it's foolishness in the world's eyes, take a look at yourselves. God did not choose you based on your wisdom. God did not choose the wise gurus of Corinth. He chose some of the fools in Corinth. God chose not the wisest in the world. He chose those whom the world tends to scoff at. To the world, the Corinthian church was filled with a bunch of fools. But God's action of choosing the unintelligent in Corinth and not the wisest was a condemnation of the world's wisdom. Paul ends this chapter by giving us a definition of what wisdom is. He gives us a definition of The definition of wisdom is not a concept. 
The definition of wisdom is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ himself. It's only by Jesus Christ that we can obtain righteousness, have a right standing with God. It's only by Jesus that we can be set free from our sins. And Paul's call to the Corinthians was that they would exalt in Christ and nothing else. Paul's call to the Corinthians was that they would exalt and boast in Christ and nothing else. My guess is that if we were to wake up in Corinth tomorrow, although our clothing would be different, we'd be speaking a different language, we'd be surrounded by different buildings, but the culture and the philosophical ideas of the culture would be very much the same as our culture today. Paul gives us here Paul gives us two types of wisdom that the Corinthian church was up against in the world. It's the same two types of wisdom that we're up against today in our world. The first form here is religious forms of wisdom. I already mentioned that Paul criticizes the Jews for seeking signs. For seeking signs. Jesus encountered uh, some religious leaders in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 40. And although I won't read it here, you might remember that Jesus is asked to give signs that he indeed is the Messiah. And Jesus says, the only sign you'll receive is the sign of Jonah. And that is Jesus' death and resurrection. But to think that the Jews in Jesus' day were the only ones seeking signs, we'd be fooling ourselves. We seek signs all the time. People in our culture do. But one of the problems with seeking signs is that we only seek the signs that we want to seek. And we make up signs to seek them so that they'll uh, come true. Why else would we have so many other religions in the world? We're great at making up our own signs to seek them. But I'm afraid that sign seeking has made its way into the church as well. I think the biggest the biggest sign-seeking movement in the church is the prosperity gospel movement. It's easy to believe at times that God blesses us or God's happy with us when we receive blessings and that when life is not going well, that must mean that God is somehow frustrated or angry or distant from us. Now, there are prosperity gospel teachers that are very explicit but it's easy for us to think about these things ourselves. It's easy for us to think that sometimes if life is going well, then well, God must be happy with us or God must be blessing us. And if life is not, then I must be doing something wrong or, or God is distant. But to live a life like that is to disregard Paul's plea to boast in the cross of Christ and nothing else. Academic circles, the second form of wisdom is, is academic wisdom, was another area in ancient Corinth that people sought wisdom. We're surrounded by similar ideals, similar pursuits. New Age philosophy or postmodernism in our culture today says we should question, we should doubt everything around us. We shouldn't believe in absolute truth. But this mindset that prizes knowledge and reason and the academic world over everything else can make its way into the church as well. How often do we say, I do it all the time. Well, I'm, this person must be right because they have their PhD in this area. Or I want to listen to this person because they're so much more knowledgeable. They have so much more knowledge than I do that they, they, must, they must be right about it. We prize pastors who have a, a greater degree after their name than those who do not. But the problem with such a view is it does not boast in the cross of Christ and nothing else. So, if we want to be people of God, if we want to be people of God who are boasting in the cross of Christ and nothing else, what does that look like? What does it look like to actually boast in the cross of Christ? The first one is this, that those who boast in the cross of Christ 
place all of their efforts and energies into the gospel? Is your life marked by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, or is it marked by a distorted gospel? You see that the true gospel of Jesus Christ is offensive to the world. So if we try to not make it offensive, we're going to distort the gospel. When we start to try to make the gospel not offensive, we begin to take everything gospel out of the gospel. The gospel, one who is committed to the gospel, is not concerned with offending the world. One, though, who is prizing that worldly wisdom above the gospel will start to preach a gospel of Jesus Christ and money. We'll preach the gospel and health. We'll preach the gospel and success. Adding other things to it. Only distorting the gospel and emptying it of its power. So my question for you is, are you boasting in the cross of Christ and nothing else? Secondly, and finally, those who boast in the cross, they carefully consider their calling. Have you carefully considered your calling? Let me say what I mean. Those who boast in the cross of Christ, they're well aware of their calling, and they have a proper perspective of who they are in relation to who God is. They recognized that they had nothing to do with their salvation. God did not choose them based on any merit of their own, based on any good deed or work of their own, based on any knowledge that they had on their own power. They recognize that there's no room to boast before God about anything. So ask yourself this question. Is your primary mission and aim in the world to preach the gospel or is it to grow in worldly knowledge? Is your primary goal to be successful in your career and to live a comfortable life or is it to give up your comfort and boldly proclaim the gospel wherever God calls you to go? Are you trying to make a name for yourself in school or in your workplace or are you trying to lift up the name of Jesus in your workplace and in your school? God did not call you because of your own merit. Because God called you based on his own good purpose alone, may it be your mission to boldly proclaim the gospel and to boast in the cross of Christ alone. We just celebrated on Friday, Independence Day, the 4th of July, the birth of our nation. But Independence Day did not bring with it a cease of problems. You see, although the War of Independence was over, relations with France and England were a bit shaky and one wrong move could send the country, this few-day-old country, into another war, a war which, in fact, happened in 1812. Plagues were sweeping the land, disease was on the rise, and the political scene was a bit messy with the election between Jefferson and Adams. And as people were heading west, churches were emptying and the spiritual vacuum was filled with deism, universalism, and Unitarianism. Enlightenment ideas, which prized reason and knowledge, had finally made their way over to the Americas from Europe. College and universities, once founded as Christian institutions, were virtually void of confessing Christians. The future of Christianity seemed bleak. And if you think Christianity seems bleak today, imagine living in this time and place. In all of this, it would have been easy to, to try to accommodate, if you were the church, to the world, to make it more attractive to the world. As people were leaving, it would be so easy to want to change the message to get more people to come. There was a man, however, His name was James McReady, who pastored churches in Logan County, Kentucky. And his commitment to Christ and the gospel alone altered American history. He led his congregation to fast monthly and have weekly prayer meetings for revival in the land. And after one particular gathering of churches for communion, revival broke out as people were receiving the Holy Spirit. This was the beginning of, of the Western expansion of the Second Great Awakening in America. 
Timothy Dwight, who was the president of Yale, was another spearhead of the Great Awakening. He led a revival on Yale's campus. People were coming to Christ and revival broke out. And this revival spread to New England and New York and even the western frontier. Now people like Timothy Dwight, people like James McGreedy, who had this undying commitment to Christ alone, altered the course of American history in a time when it seemed bleak for the church. My prayer for each one of us is that their lives would be an example and an encouragement of what it looks like to boast in the cross of Christ and nothing else. Let me pray. Father, thank you for today, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ and what he has done for us. And my prayer for each one of us here is that we would know what it means to boast in the cross of Christ and nothing else. That we would live with an undying commitment to following Jesus and not the ways of the world. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, Why don't you stand as we close together uh, in worship?